Welcome to the Zoning Advisory Committee meeting of February 3rd. I like that the date is up there, so I, <laughs> I don't want this going to remind me. <laughs> so um, we do have a quorum, so we will begin, but we are expecting a few other members to join us shortly. Um, so tonight, um, we are now past the crunch time <laughs> of getting ready for town meeting. But um, there's, you know, obviously more to do. <laughs> and I thought that um, a, a preliminary discussion, just to start to air some of the issues on both sides of short-term rentals, also known as Airbnb, um, might be great. Um, also, there, there were um, references, um, uh, internet links uh, provided to us by, um, I think it was Mark Hyman and some other people. Um, and so I was able to look at some of those websites and just get a little sense of what's going on in the state um, at this point for those. So um, we can go through that. Uh, the fire sprinklers and residential developments, we've certainly discussed before, but again, um, just to delve into it a little bit more, uh, look at the subdivision regulations and potentially that can be added um, if um, planning board thinks that's a good idea, but we could make a recommendation where to add it and what type of wording we need to to go into. It looks like there's a, quite a lot of details about you know water pressure and supply and so on. So we may have to do some more research to <laughs> to determine that, um, and then go through the work plan um, and and just prioritize for the next several months what we want to do. Um, I'm sorry I didn't send that out ahead of time, so we'll, we'll be able to um, go through that, and I will send out um, an update with our discussion tonight. Okay, so regarding Airbnb short-term rentals, um, I am going to just read a few excerpts from the Internet sites that people gave us. In 2018, Massachusetts State Legislature did pass an act um, allowing short-term rentals and regulating them. Um, they, they, uh, there is a tax on them, um, and they're defining short-term rentals as anything less than 30 days at a time. That's a short-term rental. So. Um, but, um, and they do require that people register um, if they're doing that work, but it's primarily for the purpose of um, collecting taxes. So it's a mass tax connect, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and um, and the other uh, other interesting point, which I thought you know could could uh, play into our discussions on this, is that um, if someone is renting their house for less than 14 days over the year, then they don't have to collect tax. They have to still register and let the state know, of course, <laughs> but they, they don't have to collect tax. But the minute it passes 14 days, then they're liable for all of the tax, you know, including those first 14 days. <laughs> so, okay. Um, the the uh, Massachusetts state law does allow for any towns um, to prohibit or to regulate in any way um, short-term rentals. So just because the state is allowing it and collecting taxes and so on, um, they, they, uh, they still let any towns prohibit it if they want to. Um, there's also, of course, a mechanism for um, towns to tax um, short-term rentals as well. So, um, And the other thing that I thought was um, interesting, you know, and this is just for the short review, I'm sure, we need to read into it more, but um, is that um, a lot of the towns are doing registration of all properties being used for short-term rentals, if they're allowing short-term rentals. So, um, and um, the state statute does have requirements about insurance and things like that as well, so, okay. So, um, I just wanted to, you know, hear from everybody you know, your thoughts, your preliminary thoughts, what research you've done, if any, and, um, you know, what um, anecdotal information you have, perhaps, to share. 
So, um, anyone begin? What, what your thoughts are? So, I, one thing I saw is it's not just Airbnb. There is new ones coming up now, VRB and all that stuff. So, hopefully, we should make the language generic so it applies to any future <coughs> apps or anything that comes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, maybe it should have its own section instead of having to being uh, trying to put fit it into a residential zone section uh, subdivision sub bylaw or something instead it has its own section so it's clear people know what to look for so maybe that was another thing I was con thinking about but other than that it's very how, how do you regulate how do you do I want to know how do we collect data that this money it's being rented out you, there's no way how how does an enforcement officer take enforce this because they you it's not visible you somebody can come somebody can rent I do, how do we keep a track of this that seems to be like a I don't understand yet how we would be able to do that okay. I, I yes. think the primary thing is neighbors seeing a lot of unusual traffic or cars parking or coming and going and raising the issue I don't I don't think we're we're going to establish an Airbnb police force to go door to door and checking residences. But I think just being vigilant mm -hmm. and saying, you know, letting the letting people know in town that we do have regulations, and if it, it, there should be some kind of a public display that these mm -hmm. addresses are registered and they are Airbnb, and we are collecting taxes on them. Uh, I mean, I. As a, as a relatively frequent user of Airbnbs, I, I like a lot of what that has to offer. And I think as a town, you know, the third Monday of April every year, there's a lot of demand for temporary housing. So I would, I would hate to see us uh, take a stance that we're going to try to eliminate Airbnbs from the town of Hockington. I would much more be in favor of regulating it and taxing it and you know making it part of the economic fiber of the community I agree with what you're saying mm -hmm. I I personally am having a little bit of difficulty understanding how Airbnbs could be a booming business in Hopkinton but I'm with you. Like, why would you want to come here as a vacation destination necessarily? But I yeah, but clearly, I, see you know. it as it, I, I see it more as is temporary housing for business travelers mm -hmm. who are, are doing okay. business along the 495 corridor, and they don't want to stay in a Marriott or a Hilton. They they like the local flavor of of being in a community. So you know, you're in town, you know, Monday night through Thursday night, and prefer that so I yes I, I'm not saying until the International Marathon Center gets built this is not going to be a destination no. for <laughs> tourists so I've, I've used Airbnb just a couple of times but um, it's been in a situation where we're visiting family it's just a little bit too far to do it in a day trip you know and you know really wanting to spend a little bit more time with them but they're in a, an area that only has one or two pretty expensive inns mm -hmm. and um, no cheap cheap and easy hotels but we found an Airbnb nearby and you know all, all, basically all we used it for was was sleeping and then we went over to their house for the rest of the time we were there you know so um, but it was it was very convenient for that purpose so it was just uh, you know my family the four of us so yeah um, we know if something like that is already happening I mean I haven't gone on Airbnb and actually searched for Hopkinton, so maybe it could be. It, it could, could be yeah. happening, absolutely. But okay. obviously, you know, I think people in town um, want to do it, you know, legally yeah. and legally, exactly. above board and so on. Um, and so, um, you know, so by by helping define it more clearly, I think that'll help people. Um, thoughts? What are your initial thoughts, Ted? Um, I don't have strong thoughts, frankly. Um, I don't, I think that, great, you have a weekend. That doesn't mean tax, though. It sounds like, it sounds like they have had 14 days of business before the taxes get right? 14 days over a year. Over a year. So, so if our only real business is marathon weekend, then that would, no, I mean, that would be taxed. No. Right? No, but for, I mean, for the business somebody, traveler, yeah. it certainly could be. Yeah. 
So if somebody is just renting their house for Marathon Weekend and that's it, right. that wouldn't then it wouldn't be taxable. Right, right. Yeah. That's, right, that's what I thought. At least under the state law. Um, so. and, and I was just looking to see if we have, I, I think, what I think is it's mostly a non-issue. <laughs> I think we've got a handful of Airbnb properties. I don't think this came up because somebody was complaining a couple of years ago. Um, I seem to remember three years ago, maybe there was one property where one neighbor was concerned about traffic coming in and out or something like that. And I think our attitude on Zach then was, well, go talk to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> that really ought to be the end of the discussion. Um, so I, I don't have strong feelings. I was about to see what the Airbnb offerings are, are on Marathon Weekend, just out of curiosity. Um, but I don't have strong feelings on this one for or against. I, unless something happens, I don't think we're going to be a, the business travel could happen. I'm a teacher, not a business man, I don't know. But I don't think it's going to explode to be something that's really a major pressing issue one way or the other. It's my thought. So. so when I've thought about this, I've thought, well, I can understand, you know, neighbors not necessarily wanting a house being used solely for short-term rentals. So I could I could see that, you know, if, if the if the house is pretty close to their house, if it um, attracts a lot of parties or something like that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe a lake house or something like that would be a possibility yeah. for for you know, um, let's let's rent this Airbnb and we're going to have. 20 people come over and have a big party for a weekend or whatever you know um, <laughs> just I, I, I think the, that's the, the lake is another area that could be a, you know if, if you're going to be gone for a month in the summer mm -hmm. and and why could, why not yeah you could, you could collect some money anyway I mean that's, yeah exactly it, it could be but then, then I look at it from the standpoint of a property owner and saying yeah you know it would be nice <clears> to be able to make a little extra money again it comes up with the accessory dwelling unit too you know it's like you know I have this empty dwelling unit that's really separate from my own house but I'm gonna be living in my house and I'm you now making a little extra money in fact my sister who doesn't live in this state um, she does that you know they have they have a house that when they bought it it was set up it had a, a, actually two separate apartments worked really well for when they had teenagers and then going into their 20s and then they kind of had their own separate apartment um, but then they've also rented it from time to time and it's worked really well for them you know just a little extra cash you know so um, and you know it's it it hasn't been a big issue but that that's been those are short-term rentals they're long long-term rentals you know they're um, six I'd, I'd like to follow up on, on Ted's yeah. point about saying, is is this an? Yeah. Are we creating an issue that really isn't an issue, and or should we consider um, having a, a public hearing about Airbnbs to to you know See if we is. might have twenty five people show up or we may have nobody show up. And I don't think it's an issue per se. I think it's really much more of a. Well, should we talk about this before before it is an issue? You know, and yeah, and I agree. You know, public forum. You know, let's just That's let's just bring it up. And, yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to say the reason we I, one of the points when we were we wanted to discuss about short term rentals is because somebody brought up a concern that what if this is misused? Like, what if something yeah. goes wrong? But anything that can go wrong with a short term rental can go wrong with a rental house property as well. So we don't regulate regular rental so short-term mm -hmm. rental by it's special I have been trying to think of what could be the worst case in this okay if we, we don't have something how can this be misused I I, I haven't come up any with anything strong <laughs> that cannot happen with a rental home like a traffic increase if you rent your home regularly you will get traffic increase like security issues same thing if you rent out without checking but at least in these kind of short-term rentals, the apps have control about security. They don't rent it out to people without... Background There checks. is a little bit of background. Something goes on. It's not like... You, there's no zero... It's the Airbnb doesn't let you... There's ratings and stuff, right? If you get a bad rating, you don't... 
usually go get a rental back and stuff. So this inbuilt a little bit of security in there already, but I, I don't know. I can't think of a negative yet that why do we need it right now kind of a thing, but maybe mm -hmm. we need mm -hmm. to think about it. I think one way that we could regulate it some way is to use parking as a, a metric of saying you have to provide off-street parking of X number of spaces per whatever. And I'm not proposing any language, but if you keep the parking off-street, that's it, it could be a limiting factor of, of who would be available to do that. And that would, you know, the neighbors, you know, if you've got cars all lined up and down your street and it makes it hard to navigate, that's a nuisance if all the parking, again, that's one way that I think we could consider uh, regulating. But I would go back to what Ted proposed. I mean, do we really even need to start the regulation process given the, let's say, lack of market or limited market as such? Okay. So I'm just curious, Madam Chairman, if uh, uh, our neighboring towns, Milford, Westboro, Ashland, same kind of town, sort of, do they have um, uh, beyond a short term rental regulation, do they also have a Airbnb type? Regulation? I'll have to look into that. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was one link to an article um, the, about an incident in Linfield, Mass. I don't know no, where that I grew is. Up there. Do you know where that is? You yes. grew up there? Mm -hmm. Well, that there was, high school. A, there was a big party at um, you know, at, at an Airbnb house, and there was a murder. I mean, not that murders can't happen <laughs> at other times. <laughs> well, um, having spent an amount of time in Linfield, mm. I would ask the same question as what's the attraction to renting an Airbnb in Linfield, because there's exactly. really there's nothing there. Yep, but it was, uh, it was a, a big bar. house with a pool, and they just had a big party. That's I don't I have no idea what the attraction is, <laughs> but so I, yeah. I would guess you could find the same thing in Hopkinton. Yes, the that, and that's the thing. Yeah, you could. Um, but again, how would that be really any different right. from other rentals, or you know, when you go away for the weekend and your kids throw a party while you're away? You know, <laughs> I, I I personally I think I would be reluctant to come with that come up with any regulations without input because oh, okay. I, no. you know, I think the public forum thing would be a requisite to coming up with any sort of framework for how we want to do it because I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure that it's a current concern and if it is a concern, I'm not sure what mm. the concern is. To, to your point, I, I don't see really an issue with Airbnbs that you're not going to see with any other rental. But at the same time, point, uh, last week when somebody came and represented and asked for what are the regulations for Airbnb, it raised uh, like, uh, like red flag in my head, maybe we should have regulations for Airbnb, <laughs> why are they checking that? Like, yeah. that came up too, so I don't know either way, so. Yeah. It's been raised, you know, every, every so often. I certainly didn't mean to shut down the discussion. I, no, I think no. it's worth looking into, and I think it's good to kind of wrestle with it before it could become a problem. But I'm trying to think. What are my what worries do I have? I don't have any, but what worries do I have? Um, I have a worry that I own a house with five bedrooms and I'm going to make that five different rentals. That would worry me if I was the neighbor, right? So that has me a bit concerned. I worry about an Airbnb slumlord <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. buying their properties and letting them fall apart. But then I think. Who's going to rent that Airbnb? Pretty quickly, it's going to come out that that's a slummy yeah. place to stay. So that really doesn't scare me that much. I, I like the idea of if it's a weekend rental that the owner lives there most of the time, that it's not a property bought just for making money. But I also don't think they're going to make a lot of money year round on it anyway. And that's probably a pretty bad investment if that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> so those are the things that pop into my head for worries. And then I think, yeah, I don't see them. By the way, I didn't look it up um, for this weekend. Uh, Air, I didn't look up VRBO, which I think is remarketing as Verbo. They were once VRBO. Oh, now it's okay. Verbo. That's what it sounds like on the commercials. Anyway, I didn't look them up. Airbnb has exactly zero offerings in Hopkinton this weekend <laughs> and exactly zero marathon weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time we did this, I looked it up and I think there were two or three. Yeah, I, th I think I remember that. I somebody looking it up at one point. Or over here mm -hmm. A, B, 
Street, somewhere over there. So, but what I see none on the map right now. Yeah. One other thing, in my experience, when I've looked for an Airbnb in a suburb, the entire apartment has been made available to us. Not one room and a bathroom. Right. Going by that same logic, we are, I, I'm envisioning that anyone doing it here is essentially, it's not owner-occupied at that point. It is available for rental. So that hopefully addresses any parking issues or neighbors complaining. Now, the neighbor needs to be notified in that case that don't worry about it if you see a car in my driveway because I'm renting it out for the weekend or something along those lines. But I'm not completely certain it would be a problem where the owner and the renter are staying at the same time, you've got multiple cars. Just saying that in a suburb like Hopkinton, that would be more of a reality than um, the owner letting out a couple of rooms. Mm -hmm. But just the, in that public comment period last meeting, yeah. mm -hmm. there's a realtor coming here from Holliston saying, I have clients that are that want to know what the regulations are here. Yeah. So, the, you know. Yeah. And, and right now, it, it is not specifically a permitted use in, our, in any of our zoning um, districts. But that doesn't mean that that expressly prohibits it, or it could be interpreted. It actually could be interpreted either way. But I think I it's... It was, if it didn't say no, it was okay. Hmm. So, yeah, and that's that. But then, then the book... It's the other way around. Usually it's the other way around. The other way? If it doesn't allow it, then it's usually expressly prohibited. Yeah. Okay. Oh. But, but clearly, people are doing it, <laughs> um, and they probably think it's fine, <laughs> um, and, um, and yes, there haven't been any problems thus far that we know of. <laughs> it, it might be worth, as a first step, looking at communities around here to I what think, they're yeah. doing to see what kind of... I think that makes a lot of sense. But I, I definitely encourage you, when, when I resend out the work plan, in the um, far right column of the work plan of that item, there's a number of different links. Um, and just read what's there, and then it might link you to something else that would tell you more about a different community or things like that, okay? We should have asked that woman last week or two weeks ago whether Holliston had regulations. That's a good Good point. <laughs> but we can find out some start things. Yeah, definitely. So, okay. Sorry, just a, just a thought. Would a home buyer uh, worry about if the neighborhood has short term rentals available? Would it matter to a home buyer? I don't think so. It right? could, because it could. I mean, you never know. Because yeah. I imagine that it could affect insurance rates. It could, you know, if if something becomes. Um, prevalent mm -hmm. in that, you know, in a particular area, maybe, you know, Lakeshore, for instance. I'm not trying to alarm Lakeshore. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, could theoretically, be. it could. Yeah, yeah. It could start to affect property values and insurance rates and things like that. But not if it's one out of a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so, right? So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. But I agree, public forum, definitely. But I, I am not putting this on the back burner by any means. I think it's an important one that we should address. I mean, because otherwise it's open question and then people will do whatever they want to, pretty much. But I don't think that, you know, we necessarily want to prohibit it. We just want to have it a little more controlled. <laughs> okay. And our next topic is residential sprinklers. So the thought has been that we could include something in the subdivision regulations or recommend it to um, um, planning board that they amend the regulations to include something like that. And um, I mentioned it at the last planning board meeting that that uh, wasn't coming up as a zoning bylaw. Um, but we were uh, going to address it um, and, and discuss the subdivision regs, and they were very open to that possibility. So they're encouraging of that. Um, I cannot find my, there we go. So on page 32, 
of the PDF or 31 of the printed subdivision regs that John sent out. Fire prevention and protection measures, 8.6. So it goes through all of the things that is, are required for, um, for proper water supply to fight fires for a subdivision. That, we, that seemed to have much more to do with is there enough water pressure and fire hydrants and those types of things in the subdivision. And if there, if there aren't, then they have to create a cistern and, and those types of things. But I didn't see anything in there that talked about sprinkler systems for the home. No, nope, and that's but, but, but that, that's what we could add. But it seems like the right place yeah. to do that. Because you know, and, and when you look at the outline, this is this is the fire prevention and protection measures would be appropriate, I think. Right. So, my suggestion is that um, we would recommend some wording in here that just talks, and I don't know if it would be appropriate to add it all the way at the end or you know, how it would be organized, but, um, but it, that it would refer to um, particularly in the case of longer cul-de-sacs, longer driveways, or something like that, you know, it's just in, to in say. In the public safety arena. Public, yeah, to consider in-home fire sprinklers for, for new subdivision buildings. Could we Some could we make it a section on its own mm -hmm. in that same location but not as a yeah. item? Like an 8.5 or an 8.7, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I quickly skimmed. I don't see anything in construction requirements that fit. That seemed to be big deal stuff like building roads and stuff, not what's going on in the building. Yeah. So it doesn't naturally fit there. John, do you have any other thoughts on? So I, um, I agree that it was 8.6 that probably seemed the most logical. And I think what we had discussed in the past is not making it necessarily a requirement, but making um, the requirement, so not making sprinklers a requirement, but making it a requirement to provide an analysis and reasoning as to why sprinklers are not being proposed. Um, and I think that's, if, I don't know if we can word it in a certain way that it, that makes sense in this section, but then also then refer back to the application and say on the application, why are sprinklers not being pro uh, provoted, provided or proposed? It's good. Analysis and, and rationale or reason reasoning. And I, I don't know, it, it might be um, a little ambitious, but I'm... I'm one thought that came to my head as I was thinking about this earlier is that if there's some kind of safety, you know how we have like an environmental analysis and a traffic analysis and a community impact analysis, if there's a safety analysis that you can kind of loop a bunch of things in, but I can't think of it off the top of my head, I can't think of another safety thing that you'd want to loop in, but I think that would be a good way to have fire sprinklers addressed and if there is a in future, if there is a lighting thing, it can come into the safety safety one. This is a good one. To, um, I'll I'll talk to Chief Slayman about you know that fire safety analysis. Basically, you know, is there any specific analysis that they should be doing? You know, is there any you know so? Yeah. I assume we looking for an answer. Sorry, don't go ahead. Interrupt go ahead, please. <laughs> I assume that all the other safety stuff is done by the building inspector. And I don't know how to build a house, but <laughs> do you have beams that support the weight of the second floor, the third floor? Is the electrical wiring done all safely? I, I assume that's all building inspector stuff? Yes. That's not what I was referring to, and that's probably why I couldn't come up with something. But, <laughs> you know, public health type things. Um, if there could be a, an analysis for walking uh, walkability which could also go community impact analysis I, I'm just kind of throwing anything against the wall to see what <laughs> sticks at this point but if you could do it like a, a safety analysis and say the analysis must include review of these items and then you can put residential sprinklers as a walkability as B I don't know I can't think, I can't think of anything else but um, I'm sure we can think of something we all combine our, our minds um, maybe at a later date but but given that you said it cannot be a requirement right would this 
B in the language of a recommendation. So uh, you can't guideline. require sprinklers to sure. be installed, sure. but you can require them to analyze the potential of putting sprinklers in. So if you have this safety analysis, or you have, we could even just leave it as a fire sprinkler analysis. It could be just its own standalone thing, and then have them justify why they're not doing sprinklers. And if it seems like it's a win-win for them to do it through this analysis, then they might end up doing it. Um, I haven't looked into the regulations as to if an, if relief is required for something, say a longer driveway or a longer cul-de-sac, you can then require it since it's not straight away, you know, done by the subdivision regulations. So I need to look into that a little bit further. Sure. I think um, I remember something like that. We brought it up. Again, you know, it's something that we negotiate with them now. Um, in in situations that are specific, you know, uh, uh, and and it has a lot to do with well, you know, we don't want to or we can't, you know, get as many houses in if we have short driveways for all of them. So if we can, you know, have really long driveways, we can get a few more houses in. But then we don't, you know, we say, well, that really wouldn't work unless, you know, and so so we negotiate that right now. But um, but I think John is saying, you know, if we can take it one step further and say, okay, whenever you have this, you know, exceeding this or you are asking for a variance about length of driveway or whatever the case may be, then we require this. So I don't know if it can go that step. So like shared, um, shared driveways require a special permit. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do a development with shared driveways. It's not. You can do the development with regular driveways. But if they ask for that relief, can you then say, yeah, you can do shared driveways, but you need to provide sprinklers to the houses that are on a shared driveway? Why can't we require sprinklers if that's what we it's want a state, to do? It's a state, state law. I, I need to find the actual language, but the chief is. And the, I forget what, what role she plays, but somebody at the state level said you can't require in your in your zoning to have sprinklers in the zone we can't require it so so here's my bigger question i'm all for sprinklers by the way i'm not yeah. arguing against sprinklers i'm trying to understand where it fits into what we're doing um the building inspector has to, requires a certain level of safety with electrical wiring right right but that's not in the zone and i don't know that's in the building code it's in the building code. Right. Why is a sprinkler not just a building code item? Why are we talking about it in a subdivision plan? Because the is state... Is it because a fire in this house can spread quickly? Whereas if the beam falls in this house, it doesn't affect the neighbors? Uh, so for some reason, one reason or another, I don't know what it is, but the building code at the state level doesn't include sprinklers. Hmm. And so a lot of the towns will just say, we follow the state building code. Or I mean, they're required to follow the state building code. They could possibly do more than that. But... The state building code does not require sprinklers. So the town, I'd have to find out the actual language or, or the requirement, but it's basically been said that towns cannot require as part of the building code to put in sprinklers. So it's it's required in commercial buildings, correct? Yes, not residential. And from what I understood from the presentation that we went to, is part of the problem that it's not going into as many residential properties as it should, is because there's not a lot of contractors that install residential sprinkler systems. Is this true for apartments as well, or does that have a different set of rules? I think apartments need sprinklers, but I'm not positive yeah, about that. Uh, there's certain thresholds where residential Density. does require it, but it's not single family development. Yeah. Subdivisions don't require it. From a zoning perspective, could we incentivize them to include sprinklers? I think to your point about more more homes in a particular subdivision. I, I don't know what that language right. would look like, but could we find a way to incentivize builders? That that is a possibility. But then then you run into the you know do we want to incentivize higher density? I really like John's suggestion of tell me why you don't want to do it. Yeah, and that's and that's the that's a good way to encourage people because it at least makes them think about it. You know, right? But and it opens up the conversation. But the counter narrative, so I don't know if we are introducing language which says, if I've done some kind of quote unquote due diligence, and here is my report, and here are the reasons I'm not going to do it, what next? I mean, are we in a position to challenge that? And we don't have the resources to do that again and go back and do it again, kind of a thing. Are, so, are we not in a position, though, that if they say, I want to 
a longer driveway to say that that maybe your reasons for not doing this are now you're talking incentives. So yeah, you're right. So I'm, so I'm that, saying it to you. Yeah. To me, that becomes a, a negotiation point. They right. want for, something. For whatever other variances the developer might be asking for. Okay. Then you can say, well, look, you're asking for this, yeah. this, and this. It gets easier to cut you some slack here. If. But I, but I like the thought of throwing it out there first to make them think about yes. it. To tell okay. me the, why they don't okay. want to do it. Okay. Because from what I understood, it's it's not particularly expensive to do it at the point of construction. That's true. For new construction, yeah. I mean, not percentage-wise, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and Aria made a good point last time. You know, we wouldn't want to be in a position ever of requiring it for all new homes because, you know, it could be prohibit prohibitively expensive if you're talking about building one home and you're building, you're trying to build a smaller home or, you know, that sort of thing. So then percentage-wise, it could be a great deal. But a subdivision, they're spreading the costs, you know, um, over a number of different homes and you know um, economies of scale and so on just to throw another thing out there that, that just came to me is it may make sense with the forms for a preliminary subdivision application or a definitive subdivision application to include just with the form some kind of flyer from the fire department saying why residential sprinklers are a good thing so that they have that information to answer that question and that flyer could address costs and address installation process and all that kind of stuff to have those questions answered. So to kind of go to your, your concern, when they just say, well, I can't do it, maybe they'll, ha they'll have the information that they didn't have before and they say, okay, I, I didn't do the fiscal analysis, but looking at this, it looks like maybe I can do it and maybe that'll buy me some goodwill. Okay. Do we have a limit to what that subdivision size ought to be to for us to, in some sense, require the... Okay. So, and the subdivision regs um, apply to um, anything that's not an ANR, right? Okay, so it's... Um, and the ANRs are limited to... Um, are they limited to by number of houses? So or is it just limited by those that are, you know, meet all the frontage requirements? Yes, yeah, so it's basically those who meet the frontage can be an ANR. So you can do... 10 A and R lots. If you have a okay. huge lot that yeah, that have front perfectly road, square, have right? The, the lot size. So it's basically the subdivision comes in whenever you're building a new road. Okay. So does that make sense? It does. Okay. Um, so the subdivision regs would would apply to you know when it really gets down to it. Um, fire sprinkler, the residential fire sprinklers also apply more now too. But um, because of um, our buildable area in town. Um, is no longer, you know, right on roads <laughs> that already exist. Um, and, um, and that's also why fire sprinklers are becoming more and more um, of interest, particularly to the, the, those who, who devote their, their lives to the safety, public safety, because um, longer cul-de-sacs, longer winding roads, longer driveways, um, narrow, narrow access, um, and long, therefore longer times from alarm to the point where they can get to, to you. And um, you know, there's the uh, how how many um, fire stations can you build in the town versus <laughs> can you take care of it in a different way? And fire sprinklers. I also are, feel this is yeah, a huge selling point because if young families are planning to move into town, buying a brand new home. This definitely would be a selling point that here it is. You've got safety built into the home. So yeah. I don't know if the builder thinks that way, but once it's there, it's definitely something that's going to be on their bullet list of mm -hmm. here are the top features of this home. You know? Now that now that I've seen the demonstration and I understand the differences and everything like that, it's it's something I will look for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it also brings down the home insurance, the home uh, insurance, okay. and the thing. So Big that difference. could be a good sell too. And it seems it seems really positive. Yeah. It's just about how we word it, right? Exactly. It's just exactly. you don't want to say you have, you cannot do it. You cannot not do it. Do it. Exactly. But if it, if we sp speaking about that, I was just looking in the same subdivision in the driveway section. They they have language that says applicants shall, where possible, provide for pedestrian or bicycle trails within the subdivision. So same way, if we just say applicants shall, where possible. Make sure that the sprinklers can be added, it's just mm -hmm. as a suggestion, and then, in addition to just putting the language in. 
So the concern with that is shall in mm -hmm. bylaws means it's required. Oh. So maybe you say should where possible because that's <laughs> that's how they differentiate. Oh. Shall is required. Should is suggested. Okay. Um, so if you put shall do it where uh, put where appropriate or where able, mm -hmm. that could be interpreted as well. You're clearly able to put a sprinkler in here. Why didn't you? It's required. Okay. And you can't require it. Okay. And then in that case, I, I also we mentioned not just in the fire section if about the long driveway or the negotiation of driveways in the driveway section mentioned that if you want to negotiate the driveways talk to the fire chief if you have sprinklers you can negotiate so it's in multiple sections so it keeps popping up somewhere somewhere so yeah okay so we are going to look at possible wording analysis rationale um, we agreed that it makes sense to put it um, either as a separate um, uh, section in the subdivision regs, um, but near the current fire um, fire protection um, item, um, and then. I'm going to look around for examples and talk to the chief about um, his his thoughts on fire safety analysis or defining a fire safety analysis that they need to do, or perhaps making it a broader public safety analysis. Um, and and we can what we can do also is um, we can create two separate wordings one that includes a specific um, if they're asking for a special permit based on uh, longer driveways a longer than normal cul-de-sac etc cetera, etc cetera, we can re you know um, say that this is required well John's gonna have to look into the legality of that but um, but we can we can offer up that wording as an alternative for the planning board to consider so a more a more prescriptive one and then the more suggestive, you know, make sure you analyze this piece. Okay. John, do you know if there's any discussion at the state house about putting in sprinkler I regulations don't. for subdivisions? I or don't. is there a lobbying group that's fighting that? Um, I don't and that know. That seems a little crazy any... to me at this point that yeah, they. I, I don't know why, and I can find out. Um, I'm just I asked, curious. I, I asked the question, work, but, but I didn't get an answer that was really. A solid answer um, so I can definitely pursue that and try and find out why it's not in there I'm, I'm curious I don't know if it helps us with our but maybe it is maybe there's a good reason to not have something in there I suppose I can't come up with it but. maybe they haven't they, come up to it yet mm -hmm. it's in the list <laughs> they were talking at that that presentation that they did about changing the certification level for people to install single-family res or non required residential sprinkler systems that the, the and unless I'm misremembering, do you remember this? They were talking about changing the, the um, certification to install residential sprinkler systems as opposed to commercial, because it's, it's not necessarily the same system in a, you know, in a high-rise building as it is in a home. Oh. Mm -hmm. And they were... Like making it... Did I make this up? Does anyone remember this other than me? I don't remember that, but me? that doesn't mean you're making it up. <laughs> well, my recollection is they were talking about changing the rules that you needed to get certified, that there weren't enough people to actually install residential sprinkler systems in all the new family homes. And I got the impression that, that was why it wasn't being pushed from a regulation standpoint. From a statewide perspective? The manpower to do it, but that there was talk. And when you talk to the chief, you can, you can find out whether I'm making all this up. Um, <laughs> but I understood that they were, they were considering changing the certification process for installers. Okay. Which Seems maybe is part of the reason why it's not statewide regulation. They just don't have the manpower to do mm -hmm. it. That's a good point. Would this apply only to um, subdivisions, Madam Chair, or could this also be expanded to individual homes, even as a recommendation? If it is a recommendation, could it be expanded to individual new homes? Where would it reside if it were yeah, that would there? Be, that would be, I mean, you could put something in the A&R section, but again, you can't really, the A&R process is a unique process where it's pretty straightforward and there's not a lot of debate. If they meet the requirements, they basically get endorsement. Um, so 
there's usually no report that goes along with it. There's no, uh, we usually even have to ask a narrative because some of these plans are not super clear when we get them into, as to what they're doing. So they, they're not even required to put a narrative explaining okay. what they're doing. We ask them for that and that's kind of a courtesy. So having them answer why they're not doing sprinklers is probably not going to happen. And also to add on to that, sometimes a aren't done necessarily for residential units. Okay. Would it be possible to put it in the application for building permit? That then puts a responsibility on the building commissioner to review their analysis. And I mean, what would be the teeth of that? Would they then not issue a building permit if their analysis wasn't good enough? I mean, if somebody. I, I would. The only reason I suggest putting on the building permit is not because I expect the, the building department to say, no, you can't build. It's just if you're going to build, I think people don't look at, at sprinkler systems because they don't think about them. They just think of them as being expensive luxuries. So if, if there could be some process to hand out just information with the application for building permit and say, at the you know, have you considered this? Or have you, you know, just to, just to make it a thought process, not necessarily to make it yeah. anything more than just throwing it out there. Did you consider it? So we could always include the flyer. So I, I think it would be beneficial for the fire department, working with me or anybody else, to create a flyer, just kind of the benefits of sprinklers, and hand that out, have a stack of them at the, the counter. Um, I'm a little concerned with the building permit application because a lot of building permits aren't necessarily for new construction. Okay. Um, they're for renovations, they're for electrical wiring, they're for plumbing. Uh, you don't see a lot of, aside from the one that's on Wood Street, you don't see a lot of single lot developments happening okay. in town. They're usually subdivisions or they're remodels. And retrofit sprinklers are apparently more expensive and harder to do than new ones. Uh, the other point is that, just talking about, I had brought up with the fire department, why isn't there a push for retrofit in New England? Because there's so many old houses that sure. aren't covered by this. And they said the, the big push right now is for new construction. They said if they can get all the new construction outfitted, then they're doing pretty well. Um, so I think putting it with a building permit is going to not be counter to that effort, but maybe cause some confusion and some I didn't. Some I struggle. didn't consider the renovation section of it. No. Yeah. Because, I mean, and also, if they're doing it for a, a, a subdivision, if they're doing it for the subdivision application itself, and then would they then have to do it for each building permit that they do? Oh, good point. Because they'd have to get a building permit as well. So I'm just thinking for, like, legacy farms, not that legacy farms is going to happen again. Or I guess maybe Chamberlain Wayland is a better example. You're having 20-some-odd mm -hmm. houses. They're going to have to then do that for 20. I mean, it would probably be the same thing for every application. It's not like they're doing it 20 sometimes, but it would be... Extra, extra yeah, I think it's a cost-benefit analysis at the I don't end of the day. I think it's arduous because it could be a simple paragraph that they just copy and paste. It's just, I don't know, if they're doing it for the subdivision and it's getting reviewed by the planning board, why would it need to get reviewed at the zoning enforcement officer level as well? No, I have them in my, in my head as, you know, subdivisions yeah. and single lot development. If, if there was a lot of single lot developments then, in yeah. town, then I think that would be beneficial, but I, I mean, I just don't see any. But the fire risk of spreading to multiple homes is higher, I guess, in a subdivision like Legacy Farm, where the homes are closer as against mm -hmm. single lot homes. So I can understand this being a cost-benefit um, calculus mm -hmm. in that regard. Yeah. So in or just, a risk-reward kind of a thing. Just to clarify, the way it was explained to me by the fire department is that it's not necessarily to prevent the spread of fire to nearby homes, though that, that is uh, a helpful benefit. It's more for personal safety. It gives you extra time to get out of the house. Um, yes. So the fires can go up pretty quickly. I mean, we saw that in the demonstration. Um, and so this kind of puts that fire out, but doesn't completely eradicate the danger. It just gives everyone in the house time to get out. Um, and then the added benefit is if you have extra time, it's going to slow the spread of the fire too but so then I don't we think that's the primary right then we should consider this for single single lots too I, yeah, yeah I, I mean think it should be considered for single lots. just at this point that. it's a lot of retrofit yeah, yeah. agreed and I think you brought up a great point of if they require it in the building code do they have the manpower to actually 
install this or is there going to be a backlog of development happening in a state that has already established that there needs to be more housing development right you know and then you're creating your own kind of uh, dam of the the river of housing it'll create an entire new industry look at the jobs right maybe that's my next career <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, I'm not going to go through the notes again, but I did jot down um, the other things that were discussed after that point. You know, uh, so John, I'm I'm going to ask you to uh, to look into the the legality, um, why it's not allowed to, not allowed to require it um, in the state, and um, and I'll. I'll set up a discussion with Chief Slayman and um, maybe we can go together and, and ask some of these questions of him as well. Um, and then to continue to look into, you know, is there any way to incorporate this into the NR process or the, um, probably not a building permit, but, um, but any, any situation for new construction? Just new construction. Okay, good. All right. So on to the work plan, which you guys don't have a copy of in front of you, the <laughs> latest version. But um, I'll very quickly tell you what we've sent on to the planning board. The car wash use, removing car wash use in downtown business district, which is we're going before the planning board shortly. Um, <laughs> The um, wireless communication bylaw, just the change to reflect the federal law changes. Um, solar farm overlay district, which planning board will still be working on um, the, um, the exact plots of land. And there's clearly a lot of public thought on both sides of this one. Um, so we need to explain it well. Um, and uh, let's see, reduce. The planning board vote was seven to two on to continue that discussion, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think. Everything else seven was to two. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, accessory family dwelling unit, most changes. The expansion, building permits for um, expansion to non conforming. Um, Ex pre existing non conforming structures. So that went there. And the um, business survival plan for the downtown corridor project um, in terms of the um, signage that we sent last time. Um, did I miss anything? I think that was it. I don't think you've missed anything, but what happened to um, food carts and traveling pet saloons? <coughs> Okay, so the mobile vendors, um, mm. last year we sent um, a memo to the um, selectmen. board of selectmen saying that we believe that was a, a you know, general bylaw issue, not a zoning bylaw. John was still trying to get a discussion at select board about that and see whether or not they were going to kick it back to us. So it's, it hasn't been discussed at the select board level. Should we poke them again? Because personally, I see that as a bigger potential issue than B&Bs, Airbnbs. Yep, I will find it on my list here. Mobile vendors, here we go, yep. Yep, JC has asked for agenda item at, at select board. I will highlight that so we can address that with him. Okay. <coughs> so of the items that we did not cross off our list this, this time, <laughs> the fire sprinklers, <laughs> we'll continue to work on that. There was another, um, another article um, possibility for um, uh, dealing with affordability, and that's the um, conversion of existing properties to apartment units to three or four units. I think right now it's limited to four 
um, but that's um, that's another one and I think that you know doing this one at a time in subsequent years is is a good strategy so we don't overwhelm people um, but that is one we can discuss in the in the coming months could madam chair could you repeat that so your sure. conversion of a standard home to a multi-unit home yes. okay so this is not a variation of our accessory family it's dwelling okay. unit is a separate sure so and that is specifically a smaller unit attached to a home of course yeah so um with the potential restrictions that we had on it um the this one is conversions of residential property which is 210-125 and that um right now there are some restrictions obviously and we can look through the the wording of it and see if we want to remove some restrictions this is one of the ones that was suggested by tom terry that we should um, look at supporting you know the the uh, affordability option is this um, something we worked on last year as well it is something we worked on the year before it was the year before the year before one where we had 20 exactly. yeah that's the one yeah I so, I remembered sitting here and and we talked to, we've talked about whether or not to address any of these and we thought we decided to focus on the accessory family dwelling unit first so it was just one of the, the several options we had to address okay yeah so but but this is you know mr terry did bring it up this year um just just last fall so okay uh let's see so possible considerations were no owner occupied requirement um fewer limits on the number of units per building um that's you know some of some of the many things that were discussed so okay don't really see how this one is a zoning issue this is downtown parking it's just like the perennial issue of downtown parking i don't i honestly don't really see how we can address that through zoning but please you know let me know if you have other thoughts well i think that keeps going back to the the fact that downtown parking requirements are not the same as they are in the rest of the town i think that's but making them more onerous doesn't solve the downtown parking issue no <laughs> so um i you know so that's that's where you know i've heard people suggest that yeah they well they should be the same as the other ones because i'm like but how can you just up the parking requirements when they, they can't provide more parking what you're basically saying is that no business will ever be able to move in there you know that sort of thing so I, I i don't see a solution that's a zoning solution not for downtown not for downtown no just just a random thought um some parking lots will have a compact car parking versus a standard car parking which will be you know smaller or narrower does that first i mean can for one can we do that and two does that actually come under a zoning discussion at all so can we have can we expand the number of parkings by saying you're going to reserve 10 and and to four compact cars which could would have been seven earlier but you make them 10 because you're now changing the guidelines for compact car parking i don't know how enforceable that is yeah. but it is sort of self-enforced right because you only got you can only park a compact well, I, car there <laughs> well. I, I watched a guy yesterday park on the hash marks that separated two different handicap parking cars <laughs> and decided the hash marks were a place he could park <laughs> okay. So if someone's big old car overflowed that spot, I don't think. I mean, how many you see it all the time anyway? The car, people parking their cars right on the line. That's true. So they build themselves more space. I like your idea. Uh, yeah. Being a compact car driver, I'd love more spots for me. <laughs> I just don't know how enforceable it is. Yeah. It, it's just that compact cars are becoming more and more preferred in my opinion mm -hmm. and uh, I mean I have to I mean that's I'm probably biased to that but <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the thing is if, say you want to do that for downtown parking most mm -hmm. of the downtown parking is street parking if my if I'm a business owner and I'm like why do I have only compact parking in front of me why can't I have customers who have regular cars that want to park in front of my business so 
that will come into play it may be harder to implement on a downtown parking it may be better easier to do it on a lot or something like that so okay. it may be the choice will be a little right but we don't have a problem for a lot yeah, at for the, the moment, lots right? that's, so that's true yeah. so in the parking section they do have a provision for compact parking uh, small compact car, car spaces can be 8 feet by 16 feet as opposed to parallel curbside parking spaces which are 8 feet by 22 feet and all other spaces 9 feet by 18 feet. 9 by 18 is a standard parking space. So can say foot. But that. parallel parking to maneuver into the space has to be 22 feet. Oh. Um, so I don't know if you'd be able to do compact parking on street. So, And there's also a limitation as to how many compact spaces you can have in a parking lot. So there is a provision for compact spaces and there's a limitation for compact spaces and I just, I don't, there's a reason parallel parking spaces on roads are a certain dimension. It's kind of an industry standard. Okay. So putting compact spaces on there might be a significant okay. challenge. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I assume it's, um, for the restrictions for it within a lot, it's a certain percentage can be compact, right? Yeah, so it says in parking lots containing up to 50 spaces, 20% of such parking spaces may be for small car use. Parking lots of 50 spaces more, up to 40%, maybe for small car use. So that doesn't help downtown again no. when we're talking about sometimes a building will have two or three spaces behind it, you know, like, um, but well, not... The new lots come in, it might be something for someone to talk about. If we, if we, build, a, right if we build a municipal lot, that would be, you know, yeah, or, or, or multi-tier garage soon, one of these days. <laughs> okay so downtown parking um i i really honestly would like to take it off here even though people are going to bring it back up again i'm sure but I'm how okay would people feel about it off hmm? i'm okay with you taking it off they're both the same way because i yeah i just i don't feel like it's no, a zoning issue. issue and we can't touch it right now if construction is going to happen and lots are going to be built and stuff we can't right now we can't make it harder so yeah okay airbnb short-term rentals already talked about that will be high on our list trash pickup for condominiums which is being introduced as a um citizens, citizens petition. petition this year trash pickup? How, oh, however I, yeah, yeah. However, I still think it needs to be researched by us. I don't think it's going to go anywhere um, at town meeting without the proper research. And um, it is going to take some, um, some light reading um, <laughs> of all of the subdivision list of conditions and covenants and whatever they're called of all the different subdivisions in town. Um, so we can obviously start with the ones that are in this um, group who have petitioned. Um, Who's but in that group? The Preserve, Davenport Village, Indian Brook, and Stagecoach. Those are the ones I wrote down. <laughs> so the only one I know right away is Davenport Village. Where I know that one too. Where are the other ones? Um, the stage State Park is the preserve is yeah preserve. that one. Stage so Stagecoach is off of Wood Street, Patriots Way, I believe. It's um, Indian Brook is in Elm Street, right next after Elmwood School. After okay, that. after uh, Elmwood, Elmwood School. School. Elmwood. Oh, okay. So have more people beyond the gentleman who came and made the representation. He got a group of other condo okay. associations yeah, to um, join. To, yeah. Okay. Join and petition together. Okay. But the way I look at it, we need to review these agreements to see what the um, developer agreed with the town at the time that it was built. And it has to do with the size and maneuverability um, for the for, trash, for the trash um, for um, what do you call them? dumpsters. <laughs> oh, okay. So. Um, and if it was if it was built such that, that you know if they said. And they agreed with the town that um, we will always do private pickup and therefore we are not building it to the specifications necessary for um, that then I mean that's 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 the answer <coughs> but but if they have the capability you know and if they were built with um, with the ability to um, have municipal trash pickup you know then <coughs> we can discuss it but 
um, that that's my understanding you know and we we definitely need to get uh, DPW in here I mean yeah there's John. no requirement that DPW pick up trash for anybody yeah so the concern is if this passes and it becomes um, too expensive for the town they could just stop trash collection public mm -hmm. trash collection for the entire town for the entire town I mean the, theoretically yeah Westboro doesn't do public trash collection mm hmm Southboro doesn't either, I think. How do they, it's all how do they get rid? You have to take it to the oh, dump yeah. or you have to pay extra money for the pickup stick. The, the development on Elm Street, I don't, I think they just have dumpsters. They don't, they don't have individual trash cans there. And they probably have a private company come and pick up their dumpsters, after their dumpsters. Yes, I would say so, but but if from a town's perspective, now we've got to send out, you know, trash trucks that pick up trash barrels and and dumpster dumpers, right, for that property and yeah, and there's a, there's potential. I mean, if, and if you say okay, it could the be East a huge guys, expense. Then, yeah, it could be a huge, huge expense. Yeah. Mm. And so. That would probably include all of Legacy Farms too. Hmm. Probably include all of Legacy Farms too. Yeah, and I don't know what the rules are for Legacy Farms right well, now. Well, Legacy Farms is a part of it is a condominium development, so yeah. that would be covered if they rescinded that yeah. section. They would be covered as so. allowed for public public pickup. My yeah. my other question would be about private roads like um, Devon Devonport. Yeah, it's well, listed it's a as a private road, road no that's trespassing. Part of the too, I think. Yeah, private so. roads and the. That's right. Yeah, if school buses don't have insurance to go on private road, how can trash trucks go? So then they will get into another round of trouble. There seems too many complications about it that are too many unknowns about doing this, but... Well, that would be my question, whether or not it's even liability-wise a good idea for the town to be on private roads. They have private plows down there too, don't they? Like all those places have... The have sanctuary lane has all private trash yeah. pickup, snow snow removal, everything's private. Hmm. Out of curiosity, does the moderator recuse himself at town meeting when his bill comes up? Guess he would have to. Uh, yes. Have yeah. to. I don't know if he would, but I think he's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would make good sense. I've seen other things that would make good sense at town meeting, and they don't seem to happen. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, is I, I just have a question about um, whether or not the cost has to be estimated for them to put that forward. Does the analysis have to be done in terms of cost? So, for if approval at town the meeting, the cost of accepting a road before it's constructed doesn't have to be considered I doubt this does I thought somebody we, might ask I thought we did have to <laughs> the cost so it, it is uh, so the to, not to get off topic the, the cost to construct the road has been determined from 2016 mm -hmm. it hasn't been updated and there's no requirement it gets updated in order for the road to get accepted mm -hmm. it's just kind of the subdivision approval process but I mean I don't know in terms of budget impacts if any of these things are required to provide fiscal analysis mm, okay. to be accepted. No. Okay. I think somebody probably will ask that question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next items. These, these we had previously designated as medium <laughs> on our work plan. We got through the high, high level items. <laughs> Um, subdivision lighting, street lights, or wayfinding lights, basically giving some guidelines and subdivision regs for, um, for the lighting to be provided. Um, the streamlining the permitting process, we, um, we, we discuss this quite a lot, and a lot of the stuff is, is um, I mean, I think it has been, there have been improvements in various ways in terms of you know strongly encouraging some pre-planning with 
uh, professional staff before things come to planning board or other boards. Um, I think all of those things are going to improve the process. Um, I don't know if um, um, there's much more we can do. I mean, we've uh, I have reviewed a lot of those regs, and a lot of the, them have been reviewed here. Um, but that's my opinion. Thoughts? I don't know that there's a lot we can make an impact on. Okay. Um, low priority. This was previously designated by us as low priority. These these uh, car wash add to industrial A by right. Um, and really, the question was: Is there demand for it? You know, does it you know does it make sense to add it? I th is it a special permit one right now? And it just we were talking about adding it to uh, as a by right. No, it's not. It's not not allowed at all. Right. Okay. So that's that's one um, parking requirements, and this is um, review and revise ba based on certain uses, warehouses, manufacturing. Um, again, I don't know that there's a lot of demand for it right now, but it is something we can consider discussing. Um, the, the demand is kind of like a reverse demand, meaning there's so much open office space along 495 mm -hmm. that adjusting the parking requirements might make our existing vacant office spaces more attractive relatively. Mm -hmm. And the uses are, have changed pretty dramatically over the last 20 years, so there, there might be some room for us to, to try to be more competitive. So are, are people knocking down our doors saying you've got to change this? If you talk to the commercial real estate people, they say this would be something that's attractive. Okay. If it's a change towards what? Allowing more cars? Uh, having less parking requirements. Because in, in warehouses a, don't employ as many people, so if they're using it for warehouse or manufacturing, that sort of thing, not you don't need as much parking. So, so, when, so when use you go, based. When you go to a Dell, they're, they're corporate headquarters, I mean, every parking lot space is filled there. But you, you go down, you know, two buildings down, and it's, it's half empty. Right, yeah. So it's just, it's certain uses so require the less. So idea then, there's already a parking lot there. Would it be, we want to put another building where the parking lot is? We want to turn it into grass? Like, what would they do with, if the parking restrictions were eased, so what? it didn't need as many spots, what's the next step? It, a, a lot of it has to do with um, people wanting to redevelop. Okay. And so, okay. So knock down the building. Let's, just, let's, let's just start over. And it, if we can build this new facility where we can put more building there and less space, th okay. there's a return on investment of that capital improvement. A lot of this stuff is very speculative because it, you know, we're we're guessing because the town doesn't have the capital to develop these properties. We're depending on entrepreneurs out there to come and try to do something. But I certainly have noticed things like that. Um, you know, huge parking lots around a building and a, a building used to be a restaurant or club or something like that and now is a retail store. <laughs> and, you know, it's like huge parking lot that, you know, they usually have three or four cars there at a time. So, you know, it definitely, definitely happens. <laughs> I do, I mean, the reason we brought this, it, we need to, we think that we should look at it. Yeah. What the, what the recommendation is. Don't know. Okay, and this next one was from John, and that's to teach us about the concept of form-based zoning. Form rather than use. Um, so, I think this is, this is a, it has to start as a lesson and, um, and go from there, and that we can start to educate ourselves and we can start to 
think about what that means and how that would take shape here and whether or not there would be benefit. Great. And not understanding much of anything about it, that's all I can say about it. <laughs> so, so I think that um, we should just set aside, you know, one half of a meeting for you to present that to us and teach us about it. Okay? So, you tell me when you might be ready. <laughs> okay? It's looking like the summer. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, in site plan review... So this would be a regulation rather than a zoning bylaw, potentially. Um, dark sky or lighting standards and regulations. This is kind of a long-term item that comes up every once in a while. Um, we looked at it, Ted, we looked at it like three years ago, and I'm, I think prior to that probably too, but we looked at it three years ago. Um, it could be a huge thing and with a lot of detail in it. Um, or we can simply say something vague like, you know, like is in our current regs. Um, not, you know, we, we keep uh, parking lot lights, safety lights, we keep them down to a certain level um, so that it doesn't light up the sky for everybody around the area. Um, Madam Chair, is this to address light pollution? Or yeah. Is yeah. It? Okay. But there's, you know, there's there's feelings on both sides of it. You know, we can go too far and have everything really dark all the time. <laughs> so, um, like on many of our scenic roads, I mean, you know, it gets dangerous at night. I think um, five miles an hour after nine o'clock. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, but I there's we had another proposal to increase. Increase right. the lights. Exactly. Oh, no. So wayfinding lights. That was wayfinding. Okay. So okay. not do street lights, not do big high street lights. Okay. But just you know, the really small wayfinding lights in a in a, a subdivision. So it's not almost you know, like the solar lamps. Yeah, almost okay. like those. Yeah. So I get it. It's to give guidelines. And I really think that there might need to be a public forum on this one too, just to get people's thoughts on it before we start thinking about writing any I don't know what how people feel in general um, so yeah. but I also don't think it's the most pressing issue right on the agenda. so okay uh, let's see these items um, still low considered low priority this was uh, about consolidating similar zoning bylaws and simplifying or clarifying. Um, again, it might be a pipe dream to do it because um, a change like that would still have to go through town meeting. Um, and just, you know, it, it might not be worth the work. Um, so it's just my, my organizational self thinking, oh, no, 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 we should reorganize it this way. You know, it's like, <laughs> but I don't know if it's going <laughs> to go anywhere. Um, protect large tracts of private open space. This is also being discussed as part of the growth study committee. Um, it certainly has come up. I don't know um, that specific uh, recommendations are coming out of there yet related to this, but, um, but I did, you know, we, we've talked about this. Um, town right of first refusal, what parcels that applies to in town and just clarifying all of that if there's um, any way to um, have discussions with um, property owners to at least to indicate the town has interest in any large open space that still exists in town <laughs> that sort of thing <coughs> and, and John if there's Anyone working on this within the professional staff, you know, just let us know. So, because it's not necessarily a zoning issue, it's just something that I think we all care about. So, okay, stone walls. This was a low priority thing from the planning board just to provide more guidelines for rebuilding historic stone walls when people find them in disarray along a. Um, scenic road in front of their house and so because we've had situations where 
um, we thought everybody understood what they were going to do, and then they rebuilt them looking very different than the historic stone walls normally look. So it was kind of a wake-up call that <laughs> just because we thought we knew what they were say talking about, it didn't when happen that way. When you say we, you mean you on the planning, planning board. board. I'm yeah. curious where that was. Can't remember the road. It was, do you remember, Carol? Is it Box Mill Road? Uh... Because it's one that I talked to a planning board member about. Saddle Hill or Pond Street? Pond Street? It might have been Pond Street. I can't remember. Wasn't it Wilson Street? Off of Wilson? No. No? Okay. No, it was, it was in front of a, a, some fairly large... Um, I don't know if it was a subdivision or something like that, where they were going to build a stone gate and then it was going to connect to the historic... Um, stone wall next to it and instead it, it kind of they, they used the stones from the stone wall and they very carefully preserved all the stones but then they built it into a very um, I want to say flat it's Pond Street top yeah I think so well, something similar happened in Box Mill that little road right off of yeah the and it's like well you know the old stone wall thank you for the effort but yeah, no that wasn't quite what we had in mind um, <laughs> well the one on Pond Street is very square yeah very square yeah. very very square all the road all the walls going up to it are you know just this kind of the same way yeah. Yeah. it's a retaining wall holding back a bunch of loam and stuff yeah. and it's not at all what was there before yeah anyway I was just curious yeah it was but clearly it's it happened more than here. once <laughs> <laughs> so that even though, again, it would not be in a zoning bylaw, it's something that, you know, really needs to be written and um, to, to help guide people a little bit better. <laughs> okay. Um, the retail store square footage um, we were going to increase, and that I, I think we put it aside, one, because of demand, whether or not it really needed to be done right then and there, and also because we wanted to investigate, you know, the the, the right size to increase it to, and what makes sense, and um, and also, you know, does this is this um, one of those uses that we would want to encourage in industrial A and B, you know? So um, so let's. Uh, I, I think it it should stay on our work plan. I think it is something that we need to talk about, um, but I do do think we need to do some more research on that as well. Mobile vendors then is on here. And then these are very much um, not a proposal for specific bylaw changes, but things that people have brought up to us. And I think that we need to discuss how to, how to address these, if at all. Um, consider long-term development opportunities <coughs> on South Street, and that's, you know, that's like the incentives for developers to come in since, as you pointed out just a few minutes ago, it's not a town um, putting capital into it. <laughs> um, and ways to, and these are, you know, like the ways to encourage biotechnology uses. Is there anything we can do in zoning? We, we had already talked about the um, MRTA buses and that that's um, a possibility. Brian, is Brian Hurst still on select board? He's uh, for a few more years. Mm -hmm. yeah, so he's, he has been the liaison. Um, so this is something that we can continue to look into. Um, on that topic, Madam Chair, yeah. Amazon employees are getting a bus from Westboro Station to bring them to that new office on... Um, oh, I saw that, yeah. Otis Street. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. It's a, I think, a two-mile hike, if I'm not two, uh -huh. maybe three miles, or maybe less. No, is it that three. long? I don't no, think it's that far. It's not even that far, right? No, I would say maybe a mile and a half. A mile and a half, okay. <laughs> but, but regardless... Uh, Still. Not, mm -hmm. not an easy walk in the morning. Not, a, not an easy walk. No, exactly. try to make it for train. <laughs> no, definitely not. So we definitely should be looking yeah. at something similar. Yes. If we want to attract that kind of... Uh, yeah. In this but clearly it's something that Amazon saw the need for. I mean, are they? Uh, did they? Are they paying for it themselves? I know? don't know that. So. I believe it's a private show. Yeah, it's private. So. Oh, okay. Okay. So the question is, you know, why would that make news in that case if it was a private shuttle? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
I assumed it was a town provided. Uh, um, as far as I know, it's not, but I can look into it. Okay, no, just curious. So, but I still think that, that that has merit, you know, it's like if we, we look at the, the transportation yes. issues, you know, for people. Um, and um, and Rhea has often brought up the fact that, you know, young professionals not necessarily um, as car focused as, you know, us older folks. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so. <laughs> You'll be unable to come to as much as interviews. Forget the job. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I had that problem when I first came to Boston, <laughs> not being able to get to an interview. <laughs> um, and oh, the last one is just again my organizational thing, creating a table for zoning allowed. So I was going to work with John on that. Didn't get very far this last year on that. <laughs> was that what we worked on last year? The, um the whole grid with no uh, actually that's something different that was yeah, but I, I was talking about within the zoning bylaw why don't we just take the um, existing bylaws and and create a table that shows what's in each one and I think you know I think these things exist in in various forms um, already but I'm thinking of you know really trying to introduce this so we can add it to the bylaws themselves so it's just an easy you know quick view mm -hmm. of what you know what applies to certain situations i've got so. this on my to-do list so okay so well on. i've got it on my to-do list too so. <laughs> the table we worked on last year is that that's too unwieldy or are we deciding that that well that that's really for a different purpose right yeah but but it was um, an interesting discussion i think it was i think it was as well yeah and in fact i wanted to um make sure that Sundar um, got to see that at some point and see what we did because you know I think it informed some decisions that you know some focus at least of what we've done last year. So it was it was uh, essentially talking about the uses in various and and the the value that each oh my goodness <laughs> the value that <laughs> that different categories of of business might bring okay. to the town okay and you know it's, it's it was subjective <laughs> mm. but but uh, yeah it was something right <laughs> it, was something. <laughs> it was something that we all put our collective heads yeah into. no I, I still <laughs> think it's valuable I would it yeah. like it gives you a perspective sometimes to see okay does it make sense? It's almost a scoring chart for, you know, should we be considering a particular okay. business? Or a particular it's like property. strategic planning. That's, right. That's, right. I based it on that, uh, strategic planning for business, yeah. Okay. So. okay. so that that is what's on the work plan. And um, I'm not going to make you guys think about anything else tonight, but um, when we come back on March 3rd, March um, 3rd. I would like to... Um, add any items that you think are, are burning issues that should be addressed <laughs> and um, and then we'll prioritize this work but I'll also I'll pick <coughs> two items that we can start to discuss so it's not just an organizational meeting on March 3rd we'll actually well, March 2nd March 2nd oh, March 2nd I'm sorry oh, okay. okay it's March 2nd and March 9th is a planning board meeting at which the, um, the public forum for the zoning, oh. the zoning articles will be held. Okay, so that'll be here on March 9th, right? March. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, in the library. We meet in the library now. <laughs> so March 9th is the public forum for public the forum planning board for planning board. Which okay, got it. But dealing with this year's town meeting articles. The planning board starts at 7:30. Planning board starts at 7:30. Usually at 7:30. They may, start earlier. they may decide to start earlier. I'll put it, it at seven. Okay. And I imagine they'll do zoning articles first on the agenda, but that's not decided yet. <laughs> but I, I have a feeling that that's probably how she'll organize the meeting. Honorable Madam Chairperson. I don't think there's that many items on that agenda, so probably. Okay. Good. Do you anticipate the solar overlay will be discussed between now and then with possible additional properties added to it? Or is that going to just wait for that open? It's going to wait for the session? public forum, yeah. Okay. I don't think it's going to, yeah, I don't I think it's going to We could discuss. add it to the February 10th meeting, but 
that's just going to be an internal discussion with the planning board. It wouldn't be publicly. Yeah. Uh, I guess it would be publicly advertised, but it wouldn't right. be right, right, right. a public hearing. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that it will be. When when I get the agenda, I'll take the money. We'll okay, be sounds good. Time. Just so you know, we are compiling the abutters list for the solar overlay, and we have eight hundred and fifty. The butters that we are notifying <laughs> already without and adding any additional problems, and, and that's actually not right. even including the mill for the request for a our meeting. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you're talking about oh, it's interesting. It's it for this. So it's for the it's for the article, or is it for the the new solar farm? That's not the map, built. basically. Okay, it's for the map. But what's the interesting map. is we're all butters to potential solar right now. That yeah, and, that's and what that, I. I think it, so too. It may alarm them, but the truth is, I agree, I mean, I agree we have to let them know. I'm not, but just thinking out loud, uh, the butters, we're all the butters right now. Okay, so review of minutes from last time. Just a little typo on the second paragraph about Linda Moore. Just says he, H S H E. He, she said. Oh. You see it? <laughs> Take I didn't see, I didn't see anything else. I missed that. <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> I did. I just I thought, you know, at first they might be politically correct about it, you know, but I'm like, wait, no, we know we knew she was a female. So I think it was safe <laughs> to say she <laughs> Are we adopting gender neutral gender Yeah, neutral? exactly. Uh, they? Are they saying they for everything now? They I can't stand it. I'm sorry. <laughs> My son is into it and he's insisting that oh, I use that. Oh I know, it's yeah. so hard. I can't do it. I can't do it. Okay. Um uh entertain a motion to approve. Second. Yep. Somebody has to move it. So move. So, move. Thank you. Okay. Second. Second. All of, uh, those in favor, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, opposed? Abstentions? Oh, okay, no, here. okay. And what else do I have? Nope, nothing else. Good. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I will not. Good night. I am here. Yes, <laughs> you are here. <laughs> here. Okay, I'll get the work plan out to you guys before our March meeting.